said, we are technologically challenged, which does not work well for us in the time of COVID, but, <laughs> no. but here we, we got it. <laughs> um, how, have, how have you guys been finding the, the, you know, all the turbulent situation with this year? We've honestly be, been pretty distracted. We have um, two babies. Um, one is 15 months and one is almost a year. And so they've kind of been keeping us occupied currently. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when, when I stop and think about everything, I'm just like, when is this going to start back up? <laughs> like, we have no certainty for the future, yeah. um, which is a little frightening and somewhat calming in a weird way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a strange, strange time. Yeah. We're holding up. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to hear it. And, and so you've got a new album. Yeah. Back in March. We did it February 28th. Oh yeah. Think. Right, right before March turned over. So and there's not another one. There's not another one after Satan return. I was just trying to think whether. I, no, um, we're, we're, we're kind of starting to think about a next record, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not yet. <laughs> yeah, we got to tour that record before we can. Yeah, because was it annoying out. to put it out and then to just, yeah. you know, for everything to just shut down? Did you have a tour lined up to promote it? We did. Um, we've actually just gotten most of our dates rescheduled for 2021. So we're hoping that those stay on the books um, and we can just proceed as if you know our album did just come out and. Uh, you know, just a year later. Yeah. <laughs> so. But the reception to it was really good, wasn't it? And and we, we were pleased with the receptions. People seem to um, really resonate with the songs, and we're really we're the most proud of these songs than we have been of any of the other ones. Um, so it's it's been a good yeah a good release. Yeah, I feel like we just kind of got a little teaser of how it was going to go, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, go home and stay home. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, everybody was really kind about it and complimentary. So you can't ask for more than that. I yeah, guess. well, I mean, it sounded great, but I, I hear you made it at Brandy Carlisle's studio. I uh, did. We have worked with Brandy before, um, and Tim and Phil Hanseroth, who travel with her and play with her. Um, we did our third album with them outside of Seattle at a studio called Bear Creek. Um, and then with this record, we also did it with them, but at Brandy's house, she had just built a studio um, out of her barn in her backyard. <laughs> and we were the first people, we were the guinea pigs. Um, and it, it, it went really well. Yeah. yeah, it was a kind of crazy, I don't know, I think it was kind of like the maiden voyage of the studio because, you know, we flew all the way across the country to go up to Seattle and uh, we got there and, you know, there were still engineers like plugging cables in and running wires from the house to the garage so that we could record in her cabin and get the ambiance of the, you know, log cabin walls. And it was just this kind of, um, everyone was on task to kind of make it happen. So aside from us needing to be ready musically, there were so many moving parts just trying to, you know, figure out what all we needed. But it was... Um, it felt really like a, a big team effort this time. And it felt like we were all kind of, we had the end goal, you know, that we all shared. And it was, it was really fun. You know, Brandy's really good at just kind of creating this moment. She's, she's what I call a curator, <laughs> but she just kind of, you know, she has this aesthetic and it's this like warm, relaxed, you know, friendly vibe. And we were in her home, you know, and it was so, it was just so nice and it, it felt like it was the most um the place where you could be vulnerable without being fearful and so we made our most vulnerable record in her house <laughs> yeah but we've been fans of hers for years and years we first discovered her music you know when we were i think i was maybe 20 when i heard her record for the first time and we were just big fans of you know the strong kind of femininity that that she exudes and um, obviously her writing and, and singing is pretty ridiculous and never really dreamed that we would be able to get to tour together and make records, but sometimes things happen that you don't expect. <laughs> well, you guys have made um, records in some really amazing places. And, and I mean, obviously you have 
you have that sound that's kind of quite old school um, and those amazing harmonies and it's just really quite refreshing to hear music like that these days. Oh, you know, not, you. not saying that, you know, all the new stuff and all the new styles and, you know, I like, I like hip hop and I like dance music and all the rest of it, but I don't know, you know, I have a particular fondness for the kind of this style of music, which is just more, I don't know, there's something just warmer and kind of more heartfelt about it. And I love harmony singing and I sometimes I feel like I don't hear it enough in, in um, pop yeah. music anymore. And honestly, it was just how we grew up singing. You know, we went to a, a church that only sang a cappella music, um, no instruments at all. So we would all sing as a congregation and you would have a hymnal in front of you and read the music on the page. And that's really where it all originated for us. And it, it was our norm, normal back then. Um, yeah, when we were growing up, we didn't realize that it was, you know, rare or special to be able to sing as siblings in harmony. We never, you know, it was just such a part of our kind of Southern culture and our very small world was just so saturated with that style of music that it really didn't occur to us that it was anything appealing to people everywhere until we got our first record deal and put out, you know, our first album. And then it was kind of like, oh, wow, people think of this as like, you know, a kind of Rich. foreign, weird little thing that, you know, not many people seem to be doing. And we did, we just didn't realize that when we were growing up. So yeah, didn't um, know we could make a living at it. Yeah, so. we found a, a weird little place to kind of squeeze in and take what is a family tradition for us. And, you know, hopefully, yeah, we've made a living at it, but we've also hopefully shared, you know, a part of, of who we are and our family and our, our culture, you know, as, as Southern people um, in the Bible Belt, you know, surrounded by all different kinds of music. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just what we do and we don't know how to do anything else. Maybe one day we'll make a hip hop record. <laughs> oh, well, I hope, yeah, I hope you stick to, you guys stick to what you're doing because, you know, there's already enough hip hop. Like yeah, we don't know how to do that, so <laughs> it would not be a good record. It would not. It would <laughs> so, so, um, I mean, that there, there are so many things that, um, you know, I want to ask you about. Um, but I mean, you know, just for my listeners who don't know the kind of studios as well as Brandy's studio, um, that we were talking about. You know, you guys have recorded at Blackbird, of course, in Nashville, um, at the Village. Um, with T-Bone Burnett, you know, these are kind of very authentic, you, you know, these are like meccas for, for making, you know, pop and, and rock and roll and R&B, soul and country music. It's, they're, they're amazing studios. Um, but so when you made your first album, um, there's a really interesting story um, about kind of how you got discovered or, or you know how the circumstances led up to led up to that was it you know was it an audition yeah, yes actually. yes it was kind of an open I don't want to say a casting call but you know I remember in the weeks leading up to the audition um, there were advertisements on the radio and there were um, back in the day there were flyers that were hanging around town and it was uh, in Nashville Tennessee of course which is where I lived at the time and uh I, I didn't really know anything about it, but a friend of mine said, you know, oh, there's this record label and they're coming to town and they're doing a talent search. And if you're inspired by, you know, this certain list of, of musicians that they provided, then you can go and sing a song. And it was kind of unclear kind of what the goal was. Um, well, a lot of people thought it was a hoax, I remember, because it was a major record label out of LA coming and auditioning people, which was so old school, even for 2009 when it happened. Right, um, and it felt it felt so strange because it was in Music City, which is, you know, now it's an even bigger city, but at the time, you know, Nashville's always been such a, a center for just like really talented people. And so it felt, it felt a little bit scammy in a way. I remember before I went to it, people were like, oh, they're gonna make you sign a contract and you'll sign your life away. And I was like, well, I'm not trying to go sign a contract. I just, I went because I wanted to get rid of my stage fright. Um, I grew up very, very insecure about 
my voice and my ability to perform, even though I loved music, uh, it wasn't something that I felt like I could share in a performance kind of way. Um, but yeah, we, I went by myself and it was again, just to try to conquer my fear. And I stood in there with all these people who were, I just remember all these very like professional looking people who looked like they were groomed for celebrity and they were doing all these vocal warm-ups in the lobby and they were you know warming up on their guitar and playing all this stuff and I was like I can play three chords and I got my dress from the mall and I've never had a single vocal lesson <laughs> I just remember thinking like what am I doing here and I almost walked out there were several times when I almost got up and left because I was so afraid and and just I had no confidence but I sang a, a verse and a chorus of a song that I had prepared and I thanked them and I left and I was, you know, I didn't think that I had sounded very good, uh, but I was proud that I had done something out of my comfort zone. And then they called me back um, after I had gotten back home, they called me and wanted to hear more. So I went back, I sang some songs and then I told them about my sister. I was like, you need to talk to her because she's way better than I am. And she actually, is uh, I felt like Lydia was more kind of destined for a musical career. Uh, so she came and she performed and then they asked us to sing together. And we, you know, we had not practiced anything. We had not even thought about. We were not a band, you know? No. I was in, I was in college. She had just graduated college. Um, and it just wasn't something that we were looking to do. Yeah. And we um, lived in separate cities. It wasn't like we were trying to actively forge, you know, a music career as a duo, but it was just that we could sing together, you know, and they wanted to hear that. And so when they heard that, it was like all these light bulbs just started going off. And within a couple months, we were uh, signed to a record label and we were in Blackbird making our first record that yeah. came out a few months later. So it sounds like a crazy story and it's been so long and, and so many things have happened that when I look back, I think, you know, does, it doesn't really even seem real. It doesn't it, seem like it happened to us. Yeah, it's, it's such a strange story and, and you only hear about that in <laughs> books and movies. So, um, so it kind of happened backwards for us. Yeah. So oh, cool, What an amazing yeah. story. And it's so nice that, you know, it's so nice to see sisters getting on so well, you know. Uh -huh. You think that. <laughs> it's, uh, the families can be oh, difficult, but it's really cool. It's, it's just really, yeah, it's just so great. And the music is, you know, really wonderful. And, and, and there was a stage when, you know, after the second album at The Village, right? Yes. Um, yep. where, where you suffered a bit of a setback and you, it sounds like you got really quite musicked out, like kind of, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the label uh, and, you know, just the whole situation, um, you know, you found, you found yourselves going back to, uh, to Alabama, right? And, and I mean, you guys grew up in Mus Muscle Shoals, which is, yeah. again, like, you know, what, amazing, what an amazing place. I mean, it sounds very glamorous to a British person. Yes. I, wa I watch documentaries on the Muscle Shoals. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love that documentary. It's, it's a great place for sure, you know, and when all of that kind of bad stuff happened to us, we, we had been so busy, you know, from the moment that we got our first record deal up until, you know, making our second record at the village and then putting it out. We were so busy. It was just a chaotic time. We were all over the world, back and forth to Europe. We went to Australia. We were in Canada. We were everywhere. Um, and then once the second record came out, we had a really good tour around that record. We got to open for Nickel Creek for about a month and a half. And then it was like, after that tour was over, it just kind of all just, it was just over. It was, there was no momentum. There were no shows. There was no, you know, no really great press coverage. We just, well, it, it halted. And that was because we had a manager who we decided to part ways with and he was not happy about it and it got legal and we, you know, we were suing each other and we went bankrupt and it was just kind of awful yeah it's um, the backside of the music industry that nobody wants to talk about but it's is very there and i think it was it was especially difficult for us because we felt that you know uh these sorts of kind of big tragic 
moments in music happen to like legendary people. <laughs> And we were just this little, you know, humble duo of sisters from Alabama. All we wanted to do was just, you know, play some good shows and, and be nice to people. And it, it all just kind of imploded um, on us. But, you know, in the moment, it was really hard. But then, you know, I don't think that all the things that have happened since then would have been as sweet if, if we hadn't had to go through that really difficult part. And, you know, going back to you know, talking about Brandy, Brandy had been a friend of ours um, for several years before we made the third record with her, but we wouldn't have made a third record without Brandy. I mean, she definitely, you know, knew what was going on in our world and knew that things were really, you know, dark. And she stepped in and was like, you know, when you get some songs, let's, let's talk about making a record. And so we showed her the songs that we had for the third record. And, um, you know, Brandy, she paid for a lot of stuff out of pocket and she, she put us up in her house and arranged the studio up in Seattle and um, she just really kind of swooped in and was like no you are going to make a third record because your story doesn't need to end in this way and um, so that's why the third record is you know it, it's so heavily influenced by her and it's why we made our fourth record with her as well so, so it's it's yeah it's really cool and uh she definitely seems like somebody kind of, um, you know, keen to preserve um, that kind of era of music and, and keep, you know, bands and acts like you guys who are kind of keeping alive that wonderful sound and like, you know, making it relevant now. Uh, and, you know, just doing things like I saw she did a, a performance of um, Blue, like the Joni Mitchell record. Like, yeah, like, yeah. Was pretty cool. no big deal. Just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought that was so ambitious, but and we weren't there. We didn't get to go to that show because we were both. I think we, we were heavily pregnant, or we both had newborns. I can't yeah. remember, but I just I remember reading all of the kind of reviews of that show, and it just sounded like if anybody could do Joni justice, it was Brandy. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a very ambitious project, um, yeah. but yeah, it's it's just kind of cool to see that scene being kept like vibrant. Um, and I mean, you guys are a big part of that as well. But so to, so when you decided, you know, actually we're not gonna give up music because it, it was at the point, right, after album two, which you'd recorded at the village, mm -hmm. T-Bone Burnett, uh, um, T-Bone Burnett rather, um, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was like the producer. So, I mean, that's such a great experience. You must've been flying so high. And the, you know, the album seemed like it you know sold pretty well and stuff like but you know all of those horrible legal disputes um and like you know low moment you're close to giving up and then you know you've had this wonderful like resurgence um and part of that like so the third album you did you do some kind of like crowdfunding campaign yeah made the target like almost immediately uh yeah pretty quickly within a couple of weeks i think we were um we hit the target and and then some so we were really it was it was nice to see that our fans still believed in us and, and were still there after we had not been making music for, you know, eight or nine months and, and we weren't sure if we were gonna make music again. It was nice to see that people wanted to hear more. Um, so it, it restored our belief in our fans and, and maybe their belief in us, so. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, how did it feel to be nominated for a Grammy as well after that? like? Very Sometimes I forget that happened. Very honestly. unexpected. It was it was so unexpected. I just it wasn't even something that I thought was. Going to be. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I'll remember the day that. Somebody, is that Sorry, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I've never heard that sound before. Who knows? Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it's something to do with me. I'm sorry. I'll let me just click okay. on. Okay. No trouble. I'm not sure what. That is. I think it might be like Google Calendar being open on another screen or something like that. Is it yours? Uh, I don't yeah, I'm really sorry. Yeah, because it's happened I'm like a, a, a few I'm times. It's me, though, it might like... be us. I don't know, maybe, but I don't think so. Let's assume that it was me and that, okay. but, and that was that because it's happened a couple of times in recent episodes, but you guys uh, uh, have been the first people to kind of go, like, what is that? No, <laughs> I, it, but I haven't wanted to like cut people off and stuff because no, make sure it's not us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you were saying it was unexpected. 
very unexpected. I remember the day that we found out about it. Um, I was still in the bed whenever the announcement of the nomination. Yeah, they came announced out. it at like seven early that morning. that morning, and I was still asleep because that was before I had kids and I could actually sleep late. Mm. And uh, Lydia called me, and she was like screaming, which you know you don't want to be waking up by your sister screaming at you on the phone. Yeah. That was terrible. I remember being like, "Oh, something awful has happened." And then she was like, we got nominated for a Grammy for our record. And I was just like, that is so insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, I think you don't, it, at least for us, we had no idea kind of, we knew that it was a big deal, but we didn't really understand kind of the ramifications of it and how it would um, benefit us in a, in a way that was very tangible. Um, but it definitely, you know, even though we didn't win the category, it it definitely improved, you know, the amount of people who came to our shows and, um, you know, just kind of gave that record a new breath of life that allowed us to tour it for months yeah. longer than we would have. Yeah, so we were winding down the touring cycle for that record when we got nominated. So yeah, we were, we let it go another year or so. Yeah, you know, ride the wave. We were like this, who knows, you know, you maybe it's a pessimistic way to think of things, but I think just because of what we've gone through, it's like, I always kind of prepare myself that the record we are making is the last one, because I think, you know, you just never know what, what the future holds. You don't know if, you know, there's going to be a pandemic that keeps you from ever making another record, or <laughs> if you're going to get sued by someone and you can't tour anymore because you can't make money. Um, so I think just because of, of our experience, I always think, okay, if this is going to be the last piece of work that we put out into the world, I'm going to give it everything that I can, and it's going to be the best work that I've ever made in my life. So that if it's the last, at least it's good. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, with that record, we were just so thankful that we could put out a third record at all. And so it was like, you know, all right, if, if people still want the shows, we're going to stretch this record out as long as we can. And, and so we did. And, uh, and then came number four and now we're really stretching we're it. We're really stretching, <laughs> stretching it out. <laughs> so it's, it seems like, you know, you've kind of got definitely um, learned to be um, pretty resilient. And so like, are you missing gigging a lot? Um, and uh, is it, you know, how optimistic are you for the future of the music industry? I mean, I, I feel when I ask this question to people, like, you know, how is anyone supposed to know? But it's just interesting to hear what, what artists think about it, because, you know, in all honesty, like, I'm very positive about life, you know, when the sun's shining and all that, and trying yeah. to be positive during the coronavirus. But I do think, I do wonder, you know, people are scheduling shows for next year, and you guys mentioned that you've got um, shows rescheduled. Do you definitely, you know, do you, do you see them going ahead? Um, are you, are you, are you hopeful? And, you know, if you say yes, you're giving me a lot of hope. <laughs> it would be great to have gigs back again. Oh my God, it'd be so good. I'm hopeful. I think that, I think for one thing that we've talked about a lot is that, you know, artists like us, we don't have thousands and thousands of people cramming into venues. You know, we're happy with our smaller crowds. Yeah. And, and I think that in a way, all of this craziness with the coronavirus, it's actually more advantageous to be a smaller touring act than it is to be a large scale because, you know, we can take a break and we don't have 20 people on a salary who aren't getting paid and who don't have jobs anymore. We have a much smaller team to look after. And, you know, when and if the shows do happen again, I feel like, you know, hopefully by the time the shows happen, we'll come up with creative ways to kind of keep everyone safe and, um, you know, be mindful of space. And I, I don't know, I, I guess it's kind of going to be a, a dual effort between artists and the venues that we play, because, you know, there are some venues that are open right now, but I don't know that we feel comfortable about, you know, facilitating that kind of environment. And, you know, I mean, we will do everything that we can do to, to make sure people are safe. And I'm sure everybody on the staff at these, at these venues will do the same, but it really all depends on the audience and their comfort level. Um, if they're willing to be around that many people in one place. And I don't, I don't know if I would be, you know, and I don't know when people will feel comfortable enough. Um, 
we've got to get these cases down in the U.S. Um, that's yeah. kind of the, the or else first we can't step. ever leave our continent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're hopeful for 2021. We have, we're preparing, we are booking shows, but it's like you said, nobody really truly knows. Um, but we will continue to write and create and um, proceed as normally as possible yeah. and, and hope for the best. Yeah, well, it seems like you guys have the right attitude. <laughs> I'm trying. Some days. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, there's nothing, nothing more that one can say other than, you know, fingers crossed, um, without a doubt. So your, your sound, uh, initially when I was listening to your, um, uh, music, it reminded me of Simon and Garfunkel, uh, Everly Brothers. Those are the two artists off the top of my head, like, uh, that you undoubtedly will have maybe different influences to that, uh, I'm sure. And, and so what I want to hear uh, about is, because this is called Greatest Music of All Time, um, you know, who, who are your kind of greatest artists? Who, who are the artists that you treasure the most? Uh, yeah, you mentioned a couple of them. Yeah. Um, we grew up on a lot, lot of Paul Simon, actually, our dad. Um, he was in a bluegrass band, playing bass in a bluegrass band, but he also at home would just play Simon and Garfunkel and George Jones and... Crosby, Stills, Crosby, and Stills, and Nash. Fleetwood Mac, Linda yeah. Ronstadt. Um, so, so those are some big ones. <laughs> yeah, a lot of his generation, like 70s, 80s music, um, we were super influenced by. And, and then, like we said, the church that we grew up in, we went to a lot of, you know, our dad was also in a gospel quartet, and our grandfather was. So we were listening to a lot of gospel music and folk music. Um, so all of those just kind of, mixed together when we were kids and then when we were teenagers into our 20s um we start, started listening to our own stuff laura was really into the ramones for a while <laughs> i know that's bizarre but um so great <laughs> we're both huge fans of fiona apple um, we love what she does uh, a lot of brandy a lot of Man, we well, love Dawes, the band Dawes. We think they are fantastic writers. I think that, you know, I, there was a, a season of my life where I would wish that I could have lived in the 60s and 70s because I feel like the music from those eras, I just feel like there was such a massive musical movement then that I just, you know, you talked about feeling like it just it feels extra special that kind of era of music for you and that's that music for me you know and I remember thinking like oh they had the best music in the 60s and 70s and they did they were very fortunate but you know we have um one thing I've been really excited about is the level of songwriting that is coming out of people our age and younger right now I mean songwriting is I feel like in its prime right yeah. now as far as you know, people who are kind of in our world putting out songs that just are huge, you know, maybe not successfully huge, but just like songs that you wish you'd written, you know. Um, we yeah. really love Courtney Marie Andrews. We really love, I mentioned Dawes. I think they are exceptional songwriters. We love Gillian Welch and David Rawlings. I really so love much. Phoebe Bridgers. Yeah. So it's just all over the board. Rufus honestly. Wainwright. I'm a huge Rufus Wainwright fan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it, it's, we don't, I think in the beginning with our first record, we were kind of, um, and, and I don't, I don't fault anyone for this, but we were just kind of boxed into the traditional country category. And I remember it would always surprise people when we would talk about, you know, artists that are from our generation that we really loved. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, we grew up on that kind of old school music, but we were also, you know, paying attention and, and being fans of yeah. things that were younger. Yeah, I mean, like in the beginning, I think people may have thought that we were just plucked out of the 50s because we were wearing the dresses and doing the hairstyle and the lipstick and the, <laughs> the old sound. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we are you, modern women. Pulse as well. With, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, with new, newer stuff, yeah. But I mean, I do, I do sometimes feel, well, when it comes to modern music, you know, maybe more good music is being made than ever due to the diversity of the genres and things like that. But I think somebody put it that, you know, you have to wade through excrement to find the good stuff. And that is That's kind true. of, you know, that there are 40,000 songs a day being uploaded onto Spotify. 
But I mean, I suppose I feel bad for, for a lot of artists because I read, I read an article in Rolling Stone saying it was 1% of artists get like 99% of all the streams or something. I'm sure I believe so that. Difficult. So yeah. difficult. Um, but it's really interesting that you guys didn't set out um, necessarily, you know, with grand plans and great ambitions. Um, but you, you seem so passionate about music. And, you know, what, could you imagine what you would have done if, 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 if you hadn't been musicians, you know? Honestly, no. I, I mean, mean sisters. <laughs> this, is our, this is our 11th year doing this. Um, and so we've just really, you know, grown up doing it in a way and in the most formative time of our lives in our 20s. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, it feels weird to even think about doing anything else. Um, although we have pondered that the most in 2020, I will say. Yeah. It's like, wow if this is not going to happen again, what are we going to do? If I can't make money playing shows, what do I do? You know? Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's just, it's just a crazy time. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think it's so much of it is, is kind of who we are. And I mean, admittedly, you know, when we went through our difficult season after our second record, I remember feeling really, um, I don't know if, maybe disenchanted. I remember feeling really kind of let down by music because it had been, it's just kind of, you know, lifelong place of comfort for me where I would go when I was heartbroken or happy or, you know, fearful um, or excited. It was like music was my way of kind of processing emotion. And I remember when everything got so bad, just thinking like, I don't have anything to turn to anymore because music is so painful and so not for me right now. Um, so I think that we really had to we had to work individually and as a band to kind of fall back in love yeah. with music as a hobby and separate it from our livelihood, you know, recognizing that you can love music even if it isn't putting food on the table or keeping the lights on. You can just love it for what it is and let that be enough. And I think yeah. that as an artist, it's, it's really easy when that's your livelihood. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that, you know, I once loved it just for what it was you know, and, and didn't think about whether or not it was going to be my lifelong, you know, profession. So um, it's a, it's a strange relationship and it's one that we constantly, you know, go back and forth on. Sometimes we think, oh, this is so hard and it feels like a constant uphill battle, but then there are moments of elation and redemption that are just, yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, if there is something good about this year, it has made us value music a lot more because we've just been off the road for so long. And, and so when we actually do get time to play together or listen to music, even it's, it's so refreshing, you know, it's, it makes us remember why, um, why we do it and why we, why we love it. Yeah. So um, I yeah. think that if we, when we get back on the road again, it will, we will have a renewed sense of, of perspective yeah. on the whole thing. And I hope that because of the fact that shows have not been happening for the last, you know, well, it'll be a year at that point. I hope that it will mean that, you know, shows are really well attended when they finally are able to be held again. I hope that, you know, our kind of dry spell of, of live performance will result in yeah. really solid crowds and people just becoming, you know, passionate again about live music because I think the internet for everything that it's good for, I think that it has caused us to kind of not value in-person experiences as much as maybe we should. Yeah, they'll, um, people are just like, you know, if I can watch a live stream, then why go to a show? Why go to a show? Why do I get off my couch if I can, you know, if yeah. I can watch a show? <laughs> I literally just think, why would I want to watch a live stream? Even if it was yeah. like, even if it was like, you know, Elton John with like Mick Jagger with yeah. David Crosby playing yeah. a super group or something like yeah not like it's just not really the same it's not, Never will be. It's not as I've seen that there's i mean it's come out here in the uk there's some documentary that i just started yesterday called i think the so the hidden social or something like that it's, it's on netflix it's, it's about the effect of social media and how addictive it is and how it was literally designed specially by engineers to be addictive yeah and I fear for the future of humanity you know, if we're all locked down, um, a lot of people getting quite lonely, just glued to their phones, glued to their computers. Right. Yeah. So, so uncool. It's so much bad news coming down the line. It's like, 
if you want to be depressed and you want to be even more bummed out about the state of things, like stay on your phone all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least live shows are kind of an escape from reality. <laughs> yeah. I mean, only time will tell um, whether people will be fear fearful to go to shows by that time or if they will be so ready. tired and lonely and ready to be around people, yeah. they'll do anything to do that. Um, hopefully it will be the latter and hopefully it will be like a kind of yeah. 60s or 70s, you know, kind of cultural, well, more like a 60s-esque, like cultural, like renaissance and you'll get, hopefully we'll get loads of great shows and loads of great, like people coming together and community and all that type of stuff. Who knows? But I mean, you know, it's nice to dream I'll of that. Plan for that. <laughs> yeah. Manifest. Yeah, that. speak it into existence. <laughs> but it was very well put as well about um, about music. You know, kind of remembering that before it was a profession, before you guys, you know, were, were gigging, um, you know, to make a living, and it, where, where you just loved it for its own sake. You know, that, that was very well put. And, and I think it's definitely something a lot of artists will struggle with because I think a lot of my listeners, you know, probably don't realize that sometimes, you know, even when we had like, well, we had Crosby on and he, you know, he's thinking, you know, he might lose his house due to not being able to play shows. And people don't actually realize it's only a minuscule portion of music, uh, people involved in music that are, yeah. um, that, you know, that, it's only a minuscule proportion who are just, you know, have, have no financial worries and no worries like normal people. It's not just some kind of glamorous thing where people oh, right. work properly and, and get, get lots of money, you know, and oh, like man. at this time, That's musicians will most need more than, more than, than anyone because there's no government support for musicians, at least not here in the UK. No, um, so I, really, here. I really would encourage like everybody to listen to you guys, to listen to the Secret Sisters to check out your new record and check out all your previous records. And my final question for you is if, um, for those listeners of mine who haven't heard your music before, is there one song that you'd suggest that they start with? Oh my. Um, oh man, it's hard to say uh, <laughs> if it should be a new song or an old one. I know. Um, I would say maybe Mississippi from our third record <laughs> um and, and from this record what do you think that is so hard cabin mm, maybe i was gonna say maybe the tennessee river runs low from our third record or silver from our newest record yeah so we don't agree so there are four options for yeah you. obviously sisters can't be on the same page all the time <laughs> Well, your, your, well, your last two, two records are, def, are definitely, uh, they've been a, an amazing comeback for you guys. And, and so I'm hopefully, because I saw on your tour dates, you're playing, or you were destined to play in London quite soon. Is that yes. right? Yes, in Chapel, our favorite venue. Wow. Yeah. Fingers crossed that goes ahead. And We are, uh, we are so hopeful. We love playing there. Yeah, it would be a, it'd be a venue that would suit, suit your sound extremely well. Well, thanks so much, guys, for doing this. I really appreciate it. And stay safe and well. And uh, hopefully everything turns out, turns out good. But in the meantime, I hope everybody checks out your music. Yes, thank you. Thank so much. you. Nice, to talk to nice you. chatting. <laughs> nice to talk to you both. Bye. 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 Bye.